Oh, hi there. We're glad you're watching one of our virtual lunch presentations. We have a lot of good information that we've been accumulating over the past several years. And we invite you to look down uh, just below here and hit the subscribe button. And the little bell will give you a reminder of when our next presentation is published here on the YouTube channel. Thanks for your support. Appreciate it. Kintronics to thank for taking care of some of our expenses. And Kintronic Labs has been there, goodness, uh, for so, such a long time. Uh, starting 1949, they are ready to help anyone and everyone. Uh, they have started a new uh, arrangement here, uh, concordant with uh, Joshua taking over the lead from his dad, uh, Tom. Uh, three generations, you go down there to their office, ask them for something, and uh, they'll go right in the back and find it for you if it's uh, in stock. You can also order things now off the uh, internet if you need capacitors, and soon other things will be in there. And so it's uh, it's going to be a very nice refurbish of their website, and they're always ready. As I say, every time I've ever called them, uh, they've been there. And every time anyone tells me about them delivering a phaser or things like that, they install it, boom, it works. As uh, mentioned in the email this week, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to get help uh, during a crisis time period. Uh, how you identify a crisis? Well, uh, probably the first one is you're off the air. And I was going to say, are you awake? Or ask, are you awake? <laughs> Through the 3 a.m. phone call? Could be. Uh, and, and the big problem, of course, is uh, dealing, first of all, with what caused the problem, and then finding out, I, I, good grief, you know, the guy calls and says, we're off the air, and then you're starting to do troubleshooting, and eventually he points out that the power went out. Well, it's burying the lead, isn't it? So uh, we want to be very careful about things like that. And maybe it's uh, useful to have a protocol uh, for uh, the studio staff or engineering staff, how to react when certain things happen. And so we're going to cover some of that today, I think, and some of the other possible things to, to know about. And I'm sure, I'm sure many of you, some of you, have had this new problem where you call certain companies and either they don't know the piece of gear you have or it's obsolete and they don't really keep their paperwork handy. Or worse, they won't tell you what's inside. They won't give you a schematic. They won't give you parts. You could send it in and let them repair it. But that's about all you can do. So uh, let's uh, let's get a start here and uh, see what you do when you get called that there's a problem. What's your first step? Anyone want to share that? Excuse me. I I usually oops. If I have to get up in the middle of the night from a call, I usually make a trip to the bathroom first. And then I and then I pursue whatever's going on. That's probably a smart thing to do. That was the advice that was given to me uh, while I was getting my training on a uh, fifty kilowatt uh, Westinghouse transmitter WBZ at Hull back when I was doing summer relief in uh, uh, the summer of nineteen sixty six. Uh, the uh, Fred Osgood was the uh, engineering supervisor for BZ at the time, and he gave me my orientation. And after he ran me through the transmitter a bit, he said, well, uh, let's, you come down here, you're off the air. What's the first thing you do? And I gave him, started to give him a whole recitation, recitation about what I was going to say. He says, no, you go to the bathroom and take yourself a good, healthy blank, blank, and then proceed. And take the manual with you. No, no. I no, used to reading get material the, uh, is... Uh, 
I, I think that's the, the point. I think the key is to uh, remember uh, we're all filled with anxiety. We're off the air. We're off the air. When are we going to get back yeah. on? What's wrong? And, and the point yeah. is just calm down <clears throat> and just take a breath of ourselves. Yeah. That's well, the, what uh, I want to say young. is that 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 led me to try to think about analyzing my personal panic mode. Yeah. And uh, I found that once I I thought about that a little bit and realized that uh, the uh, the sinking feeling you get or the feeling that your insides are coming out through your mouth when that happens or whatever feelings you get, uh, physical feelings you get, you have to deal with those first so you can think straight. And uh, that was actually one of the questions I used to ask people that I was training for transmitter or operations duty. I, uh, I said, tell me about a time when you panicked and get that discussion going. Because if you can't get by that, you, you're probably not going to get to a problem solving mode uh, to be able to do any good very fast. Well, there's nothing worse than getting shocked in the transmitter and relieving yourself there. So I would prefer to. There, there's sure. also the point where you have to also figure the person, the operator or whoever is calling you, what they're not telling you, because there's always that one piece of obvious information that they haven't told you. And it would make your life a lot easier if they had. Yeah, what do they mean by you're off the air? Or oh yeah, being that's called, being called. You're uh, you're off the air, and you find out that you also have no electric, <laughs> or something like that. I or, think I said that one already, David. Yeah, or you're off the air, but it turns out that somebody's got the automation system sitting in manual, and there it sits. That, that that's right. Yeah, now, are we off the air? Is in the tr no carrier, or are we off the air? Is there's no audio playing? Did it yeah. stop at midnight because there was no log or the log got stuck in the wrong folder <laughs> or something? Yeah. Yep. yeah. I remember when we first got computers, that would happen because traffic put it in the wrong place. This was just a new thing to them. And I'm getting the call because, well, there's no sound coming out of the radio station. And then you begin to think, you know, this is not a this is not a fault in the sense that the tower is laying on the ground or you know, I crowbarred it or something. It's none of those things. It's okay. This is an operator error somewhere, but, but you're, you're right about the, we were debugging a AMDA a few months ago and I TDR both. Yeah. You, know, you have two towers could not get simpler than this. Well, one of the feed lines was faulty. The other tower sample line was faulty. You TDR them. And the fault is about 70 feet from this transmitter rims. So it's like, it's on the other side of the parking lot. And the last thing that changed was they added a line for the translator. And I'm also looking at saying, you know, the grass is all healed. I can't see that you dug a ditch, but you're telling me just a few months ago, you installed this translator. I'm thinking, okay, just the other, just a few months ago, plus three or four years, but somebody knows where they trenched the cable. Somebody was there. Somebody saw it. Everyone's like, oh no, it was great. It was perfect. It was flawless. It was by the book. And I'm like, no, somebody knows. And there may be footage of it. It's like, everyone give me your phones. I'm going to find this picture. You know, more sites are, are relying on fiber these days. And, and uh, my, my former employer here in Maine, we put all seven of our remote transmitter sites on consolidated fiber. And relying on that gave me a little bit of an angst at the beginning until I realized that consolidated had a wonderful 24-hour knock they actually would find the problems almost before I succumbed to the problem. And having that kind of backup was always good. And I think with the remote controls and the uh, automating a lot of these sites, having aux backups and everything, we as engineers have a lot more tools in our bag these days than we did in the old days. Uh, I usually know when the power is out at a site before the radio station knows because the remote control tells me as it's dying, hey, somewhere we've lost power and the gen set won't start. So I think the more we automate and, and do uh, you know remote control monitoring of points, the, the better it is for we engineers to figure out what it is when we get that call. Yes, and that's you, true. We, we have not only have the remote control, 
but we also have some graphic uh, layouts that I think it was can be the set out. And like Petapixel or one of those other uh, sources, they had taken a handful of strobe manufacturers and similar lights that what Joey has the B1X, they're all mono lights, which is everything sitting in here. And they took the light and they aimed it down a wall. So a whole bunch of different brands. And what it was is the, so obviously right near the, the head was bright white. And in the distance, it faded off and got much darker, which is what, exactly what you would expect. It grayed eight out. What they were looking for is what is the consistency with the color of the light through the spectrum? Not in a sense, is it warm versus cool, but is it neutral throughout? And a couple of the brands, when they read the color temperature of light going all the way down the white wall, they found it didn't change. So from white to light gray to middle gray to dark gray to black, it was neutral. RGB values were neutral all the way across. And then they also, they tested a lot of brands. The brands that they found were a little bit lower priced, a little bit lower quality. It might've started out white, but then there might've been a little green cast. And then it moved into a magenta cast and then maybe a blue cast and went back. So the color kind of went in and out a little bit. And to Joey's point, you can't correct for that. Uh, it's impossible because it's, you can't neutralize it because if you neutralize the magenta, well, then we're gonna get another cast. If we neutralize for the green, we get magenta. If you neutralize for red, we have the cyan. So the quality really does matter. And in portraits, you can just imagine what happens Steve, are you, Steve, are you really talking to us, Steve? I went on a face to a shadow. It's Steve. a really small area. So that Steve. is Hello, Steve. the quality of the gear. I think Steve is talking to somebody in his shop. Yeah. It was so illuminating, though. It was colorful. <laughs> well, there is that. You know, what Richard was talking about, getting, you know, getting your head right and getting out of a panic mode, you know, one of the things that I've always done, and it works for me, and of course, everybody's got their own way of dealing with it, but I kind of play a mental game if I'm on the way to a transmitter site going, well, hey, it could be this, and if so, then this and this, and, you know, or it could be that, so look at this. And so, you know, it, walk through the scenarios, and instead of being all anxious about them, I'm just kind of playing a game going, okay, which one of them is it going to be? Is it going to be behind door number one, door number two, or door number three? And so it just takes my angst level down. And more often than not, you walk in and it is one of those scenarios and you go, okay, it's number two. And away we go. Yep, you never know. Yeah. Uh, what helps my concentration on the way to the site is to not listen to the channel that is uh, allegedly off the air or impaired. Yeah. Uh, I, I find the, quiet, the quietness or listening to something else helps my thinking. The KFI engineer was responding to being off the air as he's driving down to the station and trying to figure out what's going on. He noticed that he didn't see a tower. <laughs> that would do it. And that was the problem. The, uh, the airplane hit the tower and knocked it over. And there was not much more you could do at that point, except, well, fortunately, they had a spare tower. You're forgetting it is strange if you've ever driven to the site of something that has collapsed. All of our senses loop through our brain, which is accustomed to seeing how it was before it failed. And it is strange driving to a site and you're like, okay, I don't see the tower. I don't see the lights. But the mental picture is kind of everything about it. All of the echoes are still in there. And it's like, it really is gone. Nothing worse than going out to a tower that was there and a tornado had taken it down. Yeah. yeah. Ryan's yeah, the, uh, a good one. He you're mentioned forgetting the, most here's the question thing. about which station is off. It used to be, of course, we had one station to worry about or two AM and FM. Now you might have six or eight or with transmitters even more. And so you got to find out what is it that's off. Well, yeah. and if and if you have a multitude of stations that are, in my case, are statewide, and you have somebody come in your office, as I did this morning, and say, well, they haven't been picking up the morning show for the last two months. Um, gosh, I would, would have hoped that somebody would have said something sooner. <laughs> when, the, when the phone rings. And, <laughs> David? Yeah, the phone rings, and you're asking, okay, who are you? 
and where are you? Yes. Because I may not know the night jock of it, when we had them. You may yes. not know everybody at the station. Nowadays, I hear from owners. Yes. They will Who try everything Who themselves. Who are you calling for? <laughs> <laughs> holidays where you just end up with a lot of keys for stations you may may or may not have visited yeah and the phone rings and oh good i'm talking to a new part-timer new weekender and this is their first day on the air great it's thanksgiving and it's their first day on the air they don't know but you have to all right what station well, what are we talking about you know who are you where are you and what was the last button you pressed the 3 a.m. phone call I got one night because I was the standby, supposedly. My number six cart machine is not working right. <laughs> or the teletype's out of paper. Yeah. Worse, the cart machine worked, but the lights are not blinking in sequence. Oh, the little... or, or, or the phones don't work. <laughs> oh, where are you calling from? Uh, the phone in the control room. I thought you said the phones didn't work. Well, they don't. I can't call out on them. I said, well, how did you call me? <laughs> on the uh, the panic thing, uh, from the very beginning of my work in this, uh, there was always the concern that I wouldn't be able to get the station back on the air. But somehow or another, I, I always did. Um, and then that continued on through, with, you know, working as at a manufacturer. Am I going to be able to get this product to work? Or supporting a customer? Am I going to be able to get this thing to work? But eventually it all worked out. So, uh, but there were certainly periods of panic in there. You're forgetting the most important thing is the reporter. The, whoever is reporting the issue to you, number one, can you trust their assessment? Um, do you have to translate what they're saying into common sense? Do they know how to report the issue? If they say, hey, we're off the air and you find out, oh, that means uh, one of the players is uh, uh, unplugged or, hey, we have a transmitter problem. There's The, the crown amp driving the monitor speakers died or blew a fuse. Oh, go back a few decades. I got a call uh, on the pager. We we're off the air. Turned out that the afternoon girl faded down the master pot on a Duolux. I got called once in the middle of the night because the, the DJ who was having his girlfriend uh, in the studio at the time got himself locked out of the control room. So I got called saying, hey, the station's off the air. Or similarly yeah. in those days when the carousel jammed and the station logo kept repeating over and over and over until the cops came and yeah. trying to find out if there was anybody dead in the building. I do remember getting a call on one overnight where the guy says, yeah, we had, we had two three-deck um, ITCs, and he says, well, the, the right-hand deck is out. And I said, well, can you tell me, are there any lights on it? No, there's no lights on it at all. Now, it's plugged in, right? Because everything plugged in down, and it was a stand-up situation. And I said, so look down there, and here's where it plugs in. There's a quad down there. He said, oh, yeah, it's plugged in. I said, now, you're sure? Yeah, okay. So drive all the way in walk into the studio, plug in the cart machine and just kind of look at him and go, you know, I really need you to answer the questions that I'm asking and be accurate. This is not rocket geology. Well, I had a, we, had a, we had an overnight guy that, I think he wants somebody to talk to more than anything, but he, he called me up and he says, I, I'm not getting the satellite feed. And, of course, immediately I thought, well, this was an old uh, BE uh, console. And I said, uh, make sure you don't have any cues turned on uh, because that will just knock the audio down. And he said, nope, nope, they're all off. Well, of course, like Gary, I drive all the way in and I walk in. I did even have to walk in the control room. I looked through the window and I could see he had a cue. There was a cue channel on, and so I went in there and pushed the button, and the audio came back, and I turned around and walked back out again. <laughs> I got called in recently um, because they said, hey, the mic isn't working in the studio. Can you be here tomorrow morning? And I was a couple hundred miles away. I said, okay, I will be there. I drove all the way there. I saw that the mic channel was in the B position. I hit it into A. Oh, it's working now. 
Okay, here's your thousand dollar bill for my emergency time, and I left. Here in Tucson, we had a morning crew who didn't like to really be bothered with the non-essential things like watching the transmitter, remote control screen. So one day, uh, as I understand it, I was not there, fortunately. They let the automation run out on live assist and we were in dead air. So they assumed that they were off the air and promptly pushed the button, which theoretically would put the auxiliary on the air and the main into a dummy load. Unfortunately for them, two things. The auxiliary wasn't working and the dummy load had not been wired to turn on the fan. And so after an hour or so of 25 kilowatts going directly into a dummy load, it probably was yeah. <laughs> for 15 maybe, uh, there was a lot of molten metal on the floor. Worked at a uh, TV station that had a uh, Mosley PBR30 remote control, and they shut down the microwave to the site uh, to do some studio work one night, and that thing just hopped channel to channel, turning things on and off, and dumped a transmitter into the dummy load without the water being on and burned that up. Oh, I had a, I had a guy here in, in town that wasn't my station, but he burned the dummy load up twice because he wouldn't wire the interlock until the uh, water was turned on. I'm busy. I have lot, lots of things to do. And well, anyway, I don't think he's there anymore. And that's one of the hardest things to get money. You know, it's one thing if you're making capital improvements, another to get money to fix something that was working. And you had the picture of uh, Kentronics and their capacitor collection. And I just, I look at the price tags that these things have gone up 15 dB in my career. We could buy, you know, a, a capacitor the size of your fist was $20 when I got into this. The notion that those things are doing $500,000 each and every one of them just from my capacitor. Now, fewer and fewer people use them. So naturally they get expensive. And then move but, on to the variable X. Yeah, get, yeah, and, and getting a pile of, of big resistors, non-inductive resistors to rebuild a dummy load that shouldn't have been damaged, that's a, that's a hard sell. Well, these are all good stories about things that we've had happen to us or around us or in our market. But let's, uh, let's dig a little deeper onto, let's say you're on the scene and yes, there is a problem with the transmitter or perhaps the STL or the codec that's uh, coming off the internet. Where do we go from there? You call up the manufacturer of the transmitter or the codec or the STL, and what's the first thing they're gonna want to know and you should have at your fingertips? The model number and production run of the device. What What is it and Serial number two. Yeah. Which is how many number. different versions we made is it? So serial number. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Daryl Parker always used to point out that the TFT units had four or five different manuals, uh, depending upon the serial number and, and when it was, was out. Uh, call sign is important, isn't it? So that the manufacturer can look you up in their database. Yeah. The call sign under which the transmitter was ordered. Good point. Good point. Phone Back number. Phone, phone number. Good standing. Phone I'm number. Phone number. Funny. Phone number from where you're calling from in case you get disconnected. Good point. Yeah, but that part there, I'm not sure that we really have to worry about anymore with caller IDs. Well, they don't pay attention to that. Yes, you, yes, you do. <laughs> Well, that and that number could be the front number, you know, the lobby receptionist phone number. It may not be the extension you actually use to call. Well, I use cell phone when I call from a transmitter site, usually anyway. And right. cell, service, cell service can be a little flaky sometimes. So I, ideally, before you have the problem or one has the problem, 
somewhere in your transfer site, there's a Rubbermaid tub filled with bug-free versions of the books and all of the manuals. Hopefully the right ones, uh, matching them up before the disaster is probably a good idea. I always ask little things. Do I have fuses for these things? It's amazing how many stations you go into and there is not a fuse for anything. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So one of the things that's mentioned uh, very often when we get into a discussion like this, you should carry at least a DVM with you. You're yeah. likely going yeah. to be asked to measure something. And so you ought to have a DVM at hand. Barry, I want to add something else nowadays. You need a good network tester that you're comfortable with. Like I carry my Fluke that not only will test the, the Ethernet, but it will also be a good TDR because more times than not, I've found that it, the problem happens to be a bad uh, network cable or someone did a bad crimp somewhere. Well, before you get there, you want to have with you cables. You want to have some... Uh... Ethernet cables, you want to have some adapters, adapters of varying sorts. A small have, box of those is, saves a lot of time. I have, I have a go bag. Uh, actually, it's a Pelican case that I can literally carry on a plane. It has what David mentioned. It has a, 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 a fluke voltmeter. It has a studio hub adapters, uh, all of them, uh, from quarter inch all the way up to the XLRs and some jumpers. And so I can hop on a plane and do all kinds of stuff. And if it's Studio Hub and you've got adapters with you, and then you can look at it with your with your scope, or your DVM, or whatever, you can usually figure out what the heck's going on. So that and some some basic hand tools in my little Pelican, and uh, I can pretty much handle anything. Also, what has turned out to be really handy when I left when I got it, but it's really turned handy is this. This is a portable. Uh, AC you. thermometer that is infrared the dust out of and Mac. Uh, it is so extremely it handy and it'll help it be alive. One of the things that uh, mm. we mentioned earlier of people that uh, you ask what's going on, what is the situation, we want to make sure we want to know whether there's, there's storm, whether there's icing on the antenna, whether there's power things like that. So what what else should we have handy? If we want the model number and the serial number of the transmitter or the other piece of equipment, the location, the telephone number for contact. What else do we need to have here? Mary's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> She's shaking her head. No, <laughs> in case I need a piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually uh, you do need to have not only the phone number for the support that you're calling. But if you have the number for the person that you bought the, the transmitter from, most of the time the transmitter salesman will help you out. And even if it's off hours, the, they'll make sure to get you someone that will help you. So but we're, not, yeah. we're, not even, we're not even there yet because you don't, if the power is off, you don't call the transmitter manufacturer. You call the power phone. company. You call the power mm -hmm. company and what do right. you need to have on the sheet of paper that you keep at the transmitter or with you or both? You need the account number. You need the name of the authorized person who may be exactly. the bookkeeper or the GM back at the station. Yes. And the so privacy rules have changed a lot of, you, you cannot just get on the phone and ask for help for some services because if you didn't set it up, how do I? <laughs> You say you're at a transmitter. You say you're at an electrical customer. How do I know it's really you? Yeah. And yeah. Then, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, Barry, I'd like to back up one step. The first thing I do when I go into a site that I, I have been in control of for a while is I will look at the log of the technical log and find out who was there last and what they did. Good point. Yeah. 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 Now, if, you don't, if you're not requiring technical logs at transmitter sites i think you're missing something there absolutely right oh um, no I, they give you they give you the, the the whole backstory on how the thing's been running all along yeah. and what's been done to it so it helps yeah. you find the yeah. problem yeah at the yeah, very least if, hopefully if it's just... somebody has taken meter readings and logged them at some point so you know yeah. what it, it should be doing just a yep. spiral notebook that said tower person was here, air conditioning person was here. Yep. Change there filters are, on this date. 
that's right. Here are yep. the, these are the readings on the transmitter, ran the backup for an hour. This is what I've observed. Funny sound. Is there a bearing going somewhere? Just something, didn't notice it before, but before this becomes a problem, make a note of it. Highlight, you know, grab the yellow or orange highlighter and just bring it to someone's attention. Yeah, it's much better. It's much better than we just ran out or, oh, that was the last stylus that got all bent up. You want to have the staff be a little uh, proactive. And as you say, what was the last thing that, that was done and who did it? Along with the, along with the location uh, for power or for your phone loop, if it were, or electricity, uh, the gas or whatever, police. Uh, what else would you want to have on hand? How about the poll number? That and also a 21st century issue. Um, you need to get the password of the account and the account username for the electric company and your internet provider and everything because a lot of times the, com the providers will not speak to you if it's a provider issue. That's yes. right. And they'll want a PIN number usually. Most of them use or, a PIN number. Or a secret word. Right. I think and the duck doesn't the, come down, Jeff. I think that's what David was telling us earlier, the authorized user and uh, the contact point. And, and sometimes it's every site, uh, most of our sites have an angel. We have some neighbor who's good about calling if the lights have changed in some ways. Or you have whoever brings the tractor out and mows the site. And you want to know if you have the same one for 20 years, you, it's funny how good your life can be. If you have someone that the manager found and they were just cheap and agreed to do it, and you discover, yeah, they managed to snag a phone line or a power line or knock over a power pole. What about the situation of uh, phone numbers for these utilities? Do any of you uh, today uh, have someone from the test board or someone from the tech support beyond the front line? Uh, oh, oh, we're sorry, Mr. Voris, your power is out. We'll have it on by next Friday at 2 p.m. In, it, in it pays the, it pays to have the if you can get individual cell numbers for for line crews and stuff and people that you may know um sometimes they can give you more information than the dispatchers can exactly california southern california edison uh has such a system and so does pg and e up north because they do uh, uh preemptive power shutoffs and they have a fairly well i shouldn't say fairly good they have an email system that works most of the time for all kinds of outages plus they have an outage map so uh there are circumstances where i'll just go to the outage map and see what what the area looks like and the other thing is uh dealing with power companies it's helpful if you're out in the wilderness to know the circuit they usually usually use a name for a circuit for these things and uh uh, if you're reporting something or looking for something, it's helpful to know the circuit that you're on. Yep. In, in Maine, Central Maine Power is pretty good. They actually have a system that notifies you now that they've updated all their systems down here. When we have a power outage at one of the sites, um, within minutes, my phone goes off and it says power at your name, the location, Scarborough. Uh, site on uh, Two Rod Road is out, uh, estimated repair time or whatever. That gives me a lot of information before I even have to dial up the remote control to know that, okay, Central Main Power, somebody hit a pole, you know, they're doing something, it's a storm or whatever. And that's really helped me a lot in determining that first phone call. That's and, you know, good. And then, and then I go to the CMP outage map, which they also update immediately, and I can see the outage. I can see if it's 10 people on Two Rod Road, or if it's 245 people, which means it's a big outage and it might be a while, thank God the generator started. Oh, well, it didn't, oh, site trip. Yeah, yeah. The, the internet age has brought us to a lot of that kind of information, uh, which is real good. But uh, I'll, again, uh, from personal experience, getting to a supervisor for Cox Cable is like a lifetime trauma and <laughs> You just don't get anywhere from the people that answer the phones. Yeah. Even after you get angry and you get a little bit abusive, 
And it took me, for instance, uh, in one particular case, we had a situation here where at seven o'clock one evening, we lost internet and cable. It turned out they had a, a crew that had broken the cable and walked away. And it took me about half an hour to get past the front line to get somebody to say, look, you can get somebody out here tonight or we can have big problems. Now that's just a home system, but the, it's like the old backhoe fade at your transmitter site. You call these guys and they say, well, we'll have somebody out tomorrow afternoon at three or whatever. The staffers at a lot of your utilities, these being very big companies, they have very big HR departments. And training is very important. You have all this ongoing training, but the training is not technical information. It's how to handle prickly customers. These people become better and better poker players. You can threaten all day. Their eyeballs may be sweating, but they're not going to let on. Uh, I had a deal where I had a new internet put in on Thursday. Friday evening, it stopped working. And I thought a day was kind of a short duty cycle called and complained, used the A material. It got louder and louder. The next day, there were three bucket trucks on my street restringing the cable, okay? There weren't, a little town, there were not three bucket trucks in that zip code or in that time zone for that company. So I had an effect, but they were not going to let on. And that's kind of maddening when you're trying to persuade someone, you know, I miss the phone company and tariffs because, hey, we're licensed by the same FCC that tariffs you um, or, or authorizes you. The phone company, you could kind of threaten. But uh, I think that's a big thing is that uh, telephone companies were public utilities and you could complain to the PUC. Internet service providers are not. You're, you're just stuck. Yeah, they yeah. don't want you to see their 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 rules. They don't want you to see their their paperwork or what they're required to do. And they will they'll go round and round and round to avoid it, uh, whether it uh, be an audio line or I've called and never have any of the Cox people ever told me, yes, we know there's an outage in your area. We don't see any problems. But that's yeah. Not the Barry, way it works. Barry, one thing that's also really important is when the guy is there, you be friendly with him. Maybe he'll give you some information like, hey, your line is coming from the left of your location. Know how your uh, services are delivered, whether it's left or from the right. Or no, I'll take it. I'll take that to the next level. Yes, we could ask the supervisor for his business card. And how many of you, again, I'll ask the question sort of in a general way, uh, have you had help from other engineers in the market sharing the contact points with one of the utilities? Tim? You know, one of the, one of the things that, that, that strikes me, and maybe this is just something that's been picked up over time, but quite frankly, the, the, the way to get the information and, and, and the way to put your mind at ease is to have some of this information before defecation hits the rotating oscillator. If you're in the middle of the, of the crisis, um, it's a hell of a time to figure out, okay, now who do I call first? For instance, when we, when we put in uh, spectrum internet, uh, I, I got an elevation for eight levels with names and phone numbers and, and email addresses for if we were having issues. But I asked for that up front from the salesperson. Mm -hmm. And I asked for that with a lot of our vendors, you know, up front. I said, okay, so right now we're not having a problem. You're happy. I'm happy. But if I have a problem, you know, I, we're, we're, we're going to need to get a hold of somebody. And probably your, your frontline people are going to be catching all kinds of fun from everybody and his brother. But, you know, we're one of those people that puts out information to help calm everybody down. So help me help you. Who, who can I reach out to that, on your team and, and get the information that, that you guys need and I need so that we can get back up? With our utility, it's kind of an, an, an interesting situation. There was a crisis many years ago where uh, lines were down and somebody was electrocuted. 
and there were there were lawsuits and stuff taking place. This is Consumers Power up in Michigan, and part of the deal was they wanted uh, to get out whenever there was in the uh, in the settlement. They had to get information out to the public whenever they had an outage, telling them to stay away from lines and stuff like that. And it just so happens that the station group that I'm with, the sales the sales person that was working with them. Uh, is part of the solution for that. So I've got contact information for those people. And you better believe, even though we've got generators, if I have a problem and stuff, they want us on because we're the ones that calm down people for them. The other, so, helpful, thing, the other helpful thing I found up here is um, a lot of our stations are co-located with T-Mobile, Verizon, U.S. Cellular. And I've gotten to know their techs because they show up when I'm there. And, um, and it's really great because a couple of my sites up in the boondocks, um, the guy will actually go to the site to do whatever maintenance he has. And he goes, oh, by the way, somebody's busted your front door open <laughs> on your building. And that was a five hour road trip to find out, you know, somebody had busted into the building. But the cell tech told me before the station owner even knew it. So I called the police, called the station owner. And, um, you know, having those contacts has really, really been helpful, especially in, you know, rural states like New Hampshire and, and Maine and so forth, where you've got sites, you know, and you've got other people at your sites who know that information and they know your generators and they know your power situations as well. Very helpful. We well, and here's them. here's another thing. By knowing these techs with with these providers and such that co are co-located with your site, um, there may be instances where you may be at a site somewhere, you know, three hours away or something, and you're having a problem at this site. You get a hold of this tech, then by chance, are you out at the site, or can you go out to the site and reset something for me? And I mean, I've got a guy up north that will do that. So yeah, it saves me that three hour drive. Yeah, I bought a few lunches that way. I mean, you know, buying a guy a lunch or a dinner, you know, saves your hide. Or even get with your program director and sometimes CDs or good grief if they're that, that way. Albums sometimes can, uh, or other swag can make a big difference in the level of cooperation you get. I agree with Tim, buying the lunch can save your life by creating a friend. And also if you're ending up having to wait out at your transmitter site or something, make sure you have some takeout menus there because uh, if you end up going out there and say, oh, I'm just gonna run out for a second uh, to get something, that is when they're gonna show up. So make sure you have the takeout menu. You, if you're waiting out there, you wait. Yeah, of course you have to get a restaurant that has a four wheel drive delivery in many cases, and, or, or access to the, uh, the, the camp. Ram. DoorDash is never going to my site in Caribou, Maine. I can tell you right now, it ain't gonna happen. There yeah. you go. Speaking, the speaking of remote, yeah, let's, let's speaking go of remote let's, Who's that? Yeah, what is this? speaking of remote sites, one other little thing, uh, find out who the, uh, the site tech is, if you are at, a, at an American tower, a vertical, uh, bridge or some other uh, tower site that's managed uh, by a large company because uh, knowing these people in advance can be very helpful for a number of reasons. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a, an element of preparedness. If uh, I'm going to be working at, I find, at an American tower site, I find out who, the, uh, who their uh, 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 person is that takes care of the site and make friends with them. Yep, absolutely. That that goes with where we started there. All the numbers that you should have uh, from the utilities, and then going on down the line uh, to a tower company. And now, what about your transmitter and your STL? You need to call that company. And what happens? And what if they've been orphaned more or less recently? Now that's that's question number one. Don't, um, Barry? don't try to call Marty Electronics. Don't try to uh, call some of the other companies that have been subsumed uh, or, you know, you, you, of course, Gates Air is still there in the same place mm -hmm. at the same phone number. But uh, if you're looking for Studio Hub, you don't call Radio Systems anymore. You need to call uh, Mr. Catfish. But the point that I'm getting toward now is you're sitting on the top of a mountain 
and you've got a problem and you call a company and now what happens? Well, Barry, there's a couple of common sense things you also need. They're going um, to tell you that they'll give a message because they can't talk to you right now. That, that's right. And you got to make sure if, if let's say your phones are out or whatever, make sure you have a charger cord because nowadays you, you know your battery will die the minute uh, you're waiting for a call. So always have a charger cord. And uh, as I like to say, have an analog input device. It's a pencil and a paper. Well, this just way like you we're can talking, write things down. Just like we're talking with the utility folks and the tower techs, getting to know people at your place where you buy your heavy gear, having the ability to talk to somebody uh, is important. A couple of the companies have really woken. Oh, I hate using that word. Uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of a couple of companies have become aware that they have become a problem for certain uh, engineers and uh, folks that maybe they have to go up to four or five different uh, tower sites and uh, different mountaintops. And it may be that if you have to wait for an hour or two, you might as well wait to have them call you back at the office for all the good they're going to do you. Barry, I was going to tag into your comment about uh, learning about engineers that have been up on sites. Uh, I've been up on a local mountain for about five years with an LPFM, and I could not, except for through the air, get an ISP. And after five years of you know calling for sales from the different companies and calling for techs and finding out it you know they were on the other side of the mountain or whatever, I ran across uh, a tower tech, and he said when he was up there first. This was the only building, and there's 15 and three water tanks up there now. So I just said, "What was it like? And you know, what what did you do? And, and how did you get uh, an ISP up here?" And he goes, "Oh, it, the CenturyLink Pop is in our first building that was up here, but there hasn't been anybody up here for like 15 years servicing that. Let me get you some names from the old techs that used to be up here." And after seven years, we got a tech that was up there. And he said, this is where it comes from. It's in this pedestal, it's up that pole. And now all you have to do is get it 700 feet across the parking lot. And we did that. We figured out uh, old tubes. Other engineers said, yeah, we buried a, you know, a two inch PVC that made it from this building and it's underneath six inches of soil, but you can tag into it now. And we finally figured out how to do that last 700 feet by coordinating with engineers that had some history up on the hill. Um, it's a good point. That brings up another, an, a, he brought up an excellent point. <clears throat> in Kenny Bunkport, we were there for years. And then T-Mobile came, and then Sprint came, and then Verizon updated their site. And the 100 amp pole pig was the same pole pig before all those guys moved in. All of a sudden, my HT5 isn't keeping a power because I'm getting voltage dips down to like 90 volts, 87 volts, tube transmitters, not happy. And so we called CMP and said, you know, you got to come down and look at this thing. And sure enough, they had not paid attention. Nobody had talked to CMP. They'd added all these loads well over a 100 amp pole pig. And the next day they came down to put it in a 150 amp pole pig. So it's also important to know what pole pig services you because you might, you know, once these cell carriers start adding and adding and adding, you're not paying attention. And all of a sudden that 100 amp pole pig now needs to be 150. Good point, good point. I think, uh, was it David, uh, Stuart, you mentioned making sure that there were a complete set of manuals uh, on site, because if you have all your manuals on a flash drive and you get called to help somebody else, you might not have what you need. I'm old fashioned. I, I like to have a large scale print of transmitters. I'll get it laminated and it may be the length of the transmitter room. It may go around a corner, but I want to be, I, I walk around with a highlighter, done this, done this, done this, but it is so, I've read lots of things off PDFs on my computer, but scrolling around a little at a time with your laptop, trying to figure out where this is and of course it's always at the fold where there are 53 wires coming together 
and it's just all right i'm uh, uh, no dialing for dollars movie the count is you know five from the bottom and then like I say it's always at a fold or there's a break or the pdf was from a set of drawings that had been moth eaten or something very good point very good point you mentioned uh, having them in what plastic containers or uh, uh at a lot of sites it's old-fashioned but you take like a rubber made tub you want the big heavy airtight ones that are dirt tight and bug tight. And that's uh, in West Texas, you can have a pretty airtight building. You can have no outside air used. You still get red sand on any horizontal surface. Um, if you have, this was a bigger problem on high voltage power supplies, but you would sift little gray dust out of the air and it would attach itself to 10 or 15 or 20 KV wiring. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have a transmitter as as air filter or air cleaner. That can get to be a problem, can it? When you're when the biggest voltage in the transmitter is 280 volts DC or something, it's it's a different set of problems. But having enough water to clean filters, having clean filters so you can change one but not stick a damp one back in, um, kind of a thing. Uh, the number of sites where I have refrigerators is not real high, but the number where I have extra coffee pots is is fairly high. You'll find little cheap K-cup uh, devices at some of these sites. That goes into a, a list of things that we should have on site or with us. Uh, very good point. Uh, Do it, you know, portable sanitary facilities. Um, go to your campers' websites. Um, we don't have we have composting toilets at a couple of places. I don't have any of the cassette type anywhere, but I see those in the in the camper um, websites and whatnot. I just there are a couple of things I think in the Granger catalog. It's not much more than a toilet seat on top of a like they ship with a five gallon bucket. I built one that was on a whatever the next size is twelve gallon bucket. Uh, it's taller. But you get you get some bad food in some small town diner, and, and I like supporting small town diners. But there's nothing worse than you've supported the local economy and you've got a bad case of reverse dinner when you're trying to work on transmitters. How often do you rotate water out? Like the water we store. Yeah. <laughs> Drinking water is always just in the, the package deal from the dollar store. Um, like bottles for cleaning things, we don't really have a schedule, but we go through it fairly fast. We take these. I bought a bunch of containers for oil change. I think they're two and a half or three gallon containers. Um, and five of them will fit in the aforementioned Rubbermaid tub. So we can have 15 or 20 gallons of, of, of fairly clean water. Uh, I'm in an area where you can't use the tap water. You have to use filtered water because uh, the mineral crud builds up on all the mating surfaces. Well, mineral crud, and there may be some organisms, but even uh, distilled water after six months, a year, two years? And distilled water, I wouldn't worry about it on. Water I'd filtered, maybe not boiled. Uh, that you need to be through that certainly annually. How about an emergency uh, med kit at your transmitter sites? I've gone to so many transmitter sites that I've taken over for contract engineering and I've gone in and, you know, a Band-Aid is a simple thing. We but have first, we, we we have have first aid kits stop. everywhere. And yeah. yeah, the first aid kit and the thing we add on to that is you need, uh, you know, athletic or medical tape and you need a lot of gauze. Mm -hmm. You know, buy, say, buy, a box, buy a box of the four or five inch square um, you know, wound covers, but get something big. Because the electrical, problem electrical is, tape and Kleenex. <laughs> I, I've, I, I've done both. I'm on, I'm on so many blood thinners these days that yep. I, yeah, I, I just pretty... think about it. Oh, good. I'm bleeding again. Great. It's the general problem is you get there and all the band-aids have been used and nobody not replaced. replaced. Exactly. Or, yeah. Or you discover the glue in them ages too, that if these things have been sitting there for a decade or more, they're useless. Yeah, you need to, 
everything needs a date on it and you need, you know, the large Sharpie to put some labels on things because dates are very important. Everything gets that. My son, my son tends to uh, depress upon the fact that, well, dad, if worse comes to worse, you have your soldering iron. If you cut yourself. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> I've accidentally cauterized the sides, sides of lots of fingers, but no, I've never tried that. I haven't either. I don't think I'm too game for that. The other thing, too, is uh, on the uh, marine stores, they have uh, the first aid kits that are uh, that are just pretty much generic. You could just take that up there if nothing else. When in doubt, keep it in your car. That way you always have it. I do that, too, in various kinds of ointments and antiseptics and uh, the driver door of, of my SUV these days has um, oh a a thing of extra combination locks sits in that and also bug sprays um, and a, a box of bandages for that medications like your own prescriptions like, yeah yep yeah. yeah I I have to carry those because like, I never know if I'm gonna I wasn't scheduled to take a, a night, so you have to have, if you have an extra CPAP machine or if you have an extra. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm diabetic, so I, I make, make it a point to carry, make sure I've got what I need for that. Um. Fire extinguishers. You would think that a transmitter site would have those, but then you would be wrong far too often well and it, at most transmitter sites the fire extinguisher if it's not an automatic system it's pretty useless because you have a building that's manned two or three hours a week or a month the fire extinguisher sitting there it's just another thing to get its paint burned off <laughs> yeah um one thing uh this was specific to univision 20 years ago they wouldn't allow anything but their approved first aid kit theirs had um, there was basically nothing you could put in your mouth. There were no liquids, there were no pills, and that was one of their liability control things. They didn't want as much as a bottle of aspirin in the building, but that was for, for reasons of their own. They were, like I said, you could have all the bandages you want, but you couldn't have a bottle of rubbing alcohol. What about a spray antibiotic? Depend on whether you thought you could put it in your mouth or not. Oh. <laughs> I, well, like I said, that was our summary of it. It was like a lot of the rules. We had to summarize it. By the way, I don't know if you saw it on uh, Radio Insight, but there was a deal last night or this morning. iHeart is looking at another round of uh, cutbacks, and somebody instantly, there was a meme saying, yeah, iHeart has run out of humans to fire. They're now working on office furniture. And they said, yeah, three desks and a couple of chairs have been let go recently. Here's a question that may or may not be something that you have used. Have you ever taken a screenshot of a transmitter or a part or something to share with somebody from a manufacturer? Half the pictures I Many take are things transmitter sites. Many it's, times. It, doing inventories. I, you, you, can, you can have a room where the ceiling is caving in, but you can reach around the door and you take a few pictures completely blind. And you say, ah, this is what is in that room. And there may be a wasp nest or bee's nest in the, in the crawl space. And it's like, okay, I am close enough that I'm not going to get any closer. But yeah, the camera is super useful for things like that. Now, I don't know if you guys come across this or not, but I had a transmitter here on the bench in the shop and had somebody from support trying to help me troubleshoot a problem. And he said, can you take a picture of the display on the transmitter? And of course, it's got one of these displays where the, you can't take a picture of it. I mean, the um, 
the frame rate and the shutter. The frame are, rate are, is like way off. Yeah, you're exactly. Getting the diagonal bars. And exactly, things. exactly. And I said, <laughs> the only thing I could do would be to shoot a video of it. <laughs> yeah. You get in hey, some hey. buildings and at certain angles, you'll notice the shutter of the camera and the fluorescent lights are unhappy. Yep. Um, yep. But what a great thing to have compared to decades ago. You can now, as you just said, David, document the whole place. Yeah, you just you just run through it. I like a lot of times just uh, before you write a report, go look at look at the video you did the last time you were there, because you may not have written everything down. And once you've slept, once you've eaten, once you've you know had a shower and stopped being in that you know the building, oh yes, this is the, these are the things I wanted to work on next on the list i use my phone quite a bit to record notes um, you know i used to be one as um, david put it uh, you know analog devices such as a pencil and paper but i've got where i use the recorder in my phone and i just record you know dictate notes of what needs to be done what i need to get uh, what i need to replenish and then once I get home, I go through those notes and then transcribe them over to a, a document. So one of the pieces of equipment to take to this site, of course, is a, a laptop computer. And uh, when I was answering support calls uh, in another industry, first thing I asked for is the log out of the equipment. And you can tell a lot there. I'm going to tag in on Mike previous comment. Uh, once I had uh, a technician up on this DSL line, I asked the question, how does this get up to my mountain? And they're like, you know, that bush down there, and then there's some little waterfall that's over there. And I went and traveled and took pictures of everything and got the numbers off of the pedestals all the way down to uh, uh, about three or four blocks away where they went fiber to copper into the neighborhood and got the slick number and the generator number from the phone company right on their cabinets. And I'm just creating a real quick document uh, with the pictures, but also my thoughts about if something were to go wrong with this secondary uh, STL uh, inlet, can I describe to a technician that, again, hasn't been on the mountain in 15 years or is brand new and only deals with fiber, can I describe where the pedestals are? you know, behind what bush, whatever, whatever waterfall, so that I can expedite their having to help me with their own equipment. And I'm also, I guess I'm OCD because I know this is going to fail. I just know it in the next couple of years, we're going to lose that line. Annotate a Google Earth picture of the site and A, first box, B, tie box, C, end of K, you know, conduit starts here, D, conduit ends here. You know, David, that's an interesting point. I've been up on this mountain for five or seven years. Because there's um, emergency dispatch for the state and feds, there are no Google Earths of this at all. It's all blurred out. And it's an interesting problem. Well, now, now either your hobby or your friend's hobby of the drone, let's go take some pictures. Yeah, Is it 400 feet above the valley floor or 400 feet above this piece of the rock? I've been asking, can I, you know, we're less than six miles from an airport. There's a bunch of federal towers and little alphabet soup people transmitting. I'm not too sure how legal I could get with a drone. Uh, at, Ch at old Channel 4 in El Paso, is the lower end of Comanche Peak, we had that. There was a TV station building made out of navy to rock. Everything they carved off the top of the hill to level it became the walls of the building. Next door to it, there were two-way enclosures, and there were a couple of little portables in between that. There were the alphabet agencies. It always amused me that, huh, oh, what a great country. I know where the CIA stuff is. Uh, you say, well, they can only do uh, international like we were at an international border, so we had some of that. But the, uh, yeah, having pictures of that, that for so many of these sites, they've been in use for decades. But until EMS, we didn't have addresses for these people. It was, you know, it was always a uh, tower on hill seven miles south of town. It'd drive about, drive seven miles from the city limit sign, which may have moved. But 
if it was the only tower, this is not that hard to find. Now, the little zigzag road up to it may not be documented. But uh, the, the hardest thing I remember was the phone company. We had a hundred pair of cable that was falling apart. It had soaked up a lot of moisture. And so help me, the phone guys, you'd be using one wire from one pair and another side from another pair because it's all, the, it's all they could find to work. And some of the hums and buzzes we had on those were fairly remarkable. But it was always, what is the address? And I said, I don't know, it's Channel 4 Transmitter. Now, there were like 20 other people in the building. And, you know, the best you could do is said, look, I can give you a phone number. It's in the cable. I can give you a phone number for an instrument in this building. Would that be close enough? I mean, I don't need to know where it is. You're the phone company. Look in your records. Where is that number? Yeah, our, our site has, it's blurred out. There are 17 towers, lots of buildings, no addresses anywhere on any building. And we finally figured out to get uh, uh, CenturyLink's uh, a person old enough in CenturyLink, we gave him uh, geo coordinates, and he was able to cross that with a picture that he took 15 years ago when Google wasn't blurred out because there wasn't anything of that nature up on the rock. Um, and I'm just happy to get copies of that from him. Um, and finally, I figured out that the county had gone and given numbers to the building, which only means stuff to us. It doesn't mean anything to the utility companies at all.